tomorrow, it's tomorrow, but happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Um, it's, um, for me, uh, well, some of y'all have met my mom already. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan of Mother's Day. It's uh, an important day for me because I love my mama. And uh, she's, uh, she's been, she has done a lot for me and for my siblings. Uh, coming from a single parent household, uh, being the eldest, you learn a lot, you see a lot, and you appreciate a lot. Um, and I just, um, it's always a pleasure to see, um, just to see, to hear about the contributions of moms in people's lives, because I know it's always different, it's unique for each and every one of us. But uh, I just wanted to say Happy Mother's Day to all of you. I want to uh, share one little um, reading that for me has always been special. Uh, so please bear with me as I do my brief little Mother's Day tribute. And once uh, Jeremiah wakes up, you may see Miss Lena running around uh, giving a Mother's Day gift from, from me. Uh, but this is a um, special reading here based is a devotional called My Life Today. And this reading comes from January 17. And the scripture reading attached to this is Isaiah 49, verse 25, where it says, For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. It's a beautiful Bible promise there. Uh, this is what the reading says. Great responsibilities rest upon you, mothers. You may aid them to develop characters that will not be swayed or influenced to do evil, but will sway and influence others to do right. By your fervent prayers of faith, you can move the arm that moves the world. The prayers of Christian mothers are not disregarded by the Father of all. He will not turn away your petitions and leave you and yours to the buffetings of Satan in the great day of the final conflict. It is for you to work with simplicity and faithfulness, and God will establish the work of your hands. And it concludes by saying, when the well done of the great judge is pronounced and the crown of immortal glory is placed upon the brow of the victor, many will rise their crowns in sight of the assembled universe and pointing to their mother, say, she made me all that I am through the grace of God. Her instruction, her prayers have been blessed to my eternal salvation. So I just want to say thank you, mothers, for what you do. Uh, it will, uh, I, I know for sure that only when we get to heaven will we really know the, the uh, efforts, the true efforts that you have put in uh, to help us become all that we are today. So thank you. Um, let us have a quick word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you so much for your, for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you have uh, gifted us with many gifts. And in particular this weekend, we want to recognize our moms and for the gift that uh, they are to us in our life. And Father, some of us here may not have mothers anymore, but we can see and recognize other ladies that have played that role, that have satisfied that need in our lives. And for them, we thank you as well. Father, we thank you for the blessings, for the grace that we have in you. Father, give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are um, looking through a couple, uh, a little sermon series that I have here. Um, and today we're gonna, last, uh, last time I was with you, uh, we talked about the Trinity. We talked about the importance of the Trinity and what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all do. Today I wanna focus on the Father. Today I wanna focus on the greatness and the love of your Father and what he does for you. Amen? Uh, what, there's no better verse that I can think of that talks about the love of the Father than uh, anyone want to guess what verse I'm going to quote now? Anyone? 
No, something that talks about the love of God. A very famous verse, probably the most famous verse. John 3.16, let's read that together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that what? Whosoever shall believe in him, what? Shall not perish but have everlasting life. I love, obviously, everyone always emphasizes different aspects. Some people will emphasize that God's so loved, and, you know, and, and, and there's different aspects of it. But for me, let me share with you quickly my most important and most favorite phrase in this whole entire verse, and it's the phrase that whosoever. I just love that word, whosoever. Anyone that so happens to stumble upon the love of God they will be the recipients, right? They will be recipients. I just love that, that the invitation is open to anyone and everyone. God so loved us that he made it so wide and he spread the net so, uh, so vast that anyone, and I mean anyone, has the ability to have an encounter with God's love. So let's look in, uh, let's look, turn our Bibles. If you have your Bibles, open your phones, or if you have your uh, physical Bibles, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. We're going to spend some time in Luke chapter 15 uh, because we have to understand one thing about God. God does something amazing for us, and in order for you and I to learn how to walk a spirit, a strong, vibrant, victorious Christian life, we need to understand who God is. Amen. If we don't know who God is, then it's kind of difficult to imitate who God is. So this is something, one of the promises that we find in Isaiah 49. This is actually from the same place that I quoted from. God says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. Some of us are sitting here and we have our church smile on but I know that inside we are feeling alone we are feeling worn out we are feeling exhausted and God wants you to know quickly just from the outset of the sermon that he's with you that you're not forgotten that you're not alone that he's by your side. He understands the struggles that you're going through. He wants you to know that you, he is with you. He tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 29, he says, Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will what? He will fight for you according to how he did it. God is telling you, I'm going to fight for you. I'm the one that's going to defend you. I will do it according for, uh, to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness when you saw how the Lord God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. It reminds me of that poem, famous poem, Footprints in the Sand, or Footstep by the, by the Beach. It all, I always find it diff called differently. It's that poem where uh, uh, someone is walking with Jesus and, you know, they're, they're just strolling along the beachside and the person walking with Jesus looks back and he sees that in a specific time in their life when it was difficult, they only see one set of footprints. And they turn over to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, where were you when so-and-so happened in my life? And Jesus just puts a smile and he says, it wasn't you who walked. Those are not your footprints. They were mine when I was carrying you through the problem. You see, God has a way to make sure that you have all the support possible. He moves heaven and earth to make sure that you have the aid and the support that you need through the struggle that it may be, whatever it is, because there's no problem that is too big for God, and God understands that the only way that you can be saved, the only way that you can be happy, the only way you can be content is if he provides that safety for you. It's not about what you do. 
Set about what you're able to do. Set about what you can secure for yourself. It's about whether or not you will trust that God will lead you to that place that you need to be to find the comfort, the support that you're looking for. God is the one that wants to fight your fights. I just, um, Steps to Christ. Uh, this, uh, I, I've shared this before. This is my all-time favorite book, and you're just going to hear a lot from, from this book. So I would just suggest getting it and reading it so that way you know where I'm coming from. Steps to Christ, page 51. This is what it says. Put away the suspicion that God's promises are not meant for you. When I was at Southern, my school at, uh, for my undergraduate, I recognized God's calling and God's leading in my life. I understood that I had to be there. I understood I had to study. I knew that that was where I had to be. That's where my wife needed to be. That's where my family would start. There was no shadow of a doubt, but difficulties set in. Financial challenges came in, right? Your college student that just got married, that had a career, that gave it up so that he can enter into ministry. So now Jessica and I leave our well-paying jobs in Philadelphia, and we move to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we now enter into student life, and we're trying to provide for ourselves, so we're poor. We're eating ramen soup or rice and eggs, that's all we ate for a long time. And if it was really good, maybe we'll have a little uh, uh, sweet fried plantains, and then we'll have white rice with beans, I mean, white rice, eggs, and fried plantains. That will be a luxury. And if it was a really, really nice week, or, or something happened, then maybe we'll have an avocado there on the side or something. You know, we'll spice it up and like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Anyone remember those struggles as, as a college, college age? Yeah? We were just starting our marriage. And I remember things were just so difficult. And I, I'm here going to school to be a pastor. My homework is studying scripture. My homework is literally, what does John 3.16 mean for you? That's my homework. Right? I don't have to deal with math. I already did my math. I don't have to deal with sciences. I already dealt with sciences. I'm literally going in, studying about the Bible. That's all I did. I just was studying Hebrew, I was studying Greek, and I was studying about some other stuff here about Scripture. But I remember one assignment was about what does John 3.16 mean to you? And that was like a whole letter grade. Anyone want to have that type of homework? So I remember that in this time, I, my life, is, is just invested in learning more about Scripture. I'm diving into Scripture. I'm constantly studying God's Word. I'm constantly praying. But guess what? I found myself spiritually bankrupt. Not because I wasn't diligent with my study. Not because I didn't love God. Just all the stuff of life was just coming down upon me and I found myself even though my homework and all these things that I was doing was revolved around scripture and around God I found myself crying out to God I need more of you I'm not happy anymore and I remember falling on my knees and in my room just crying out pleading out to God God please deliver me help me because I can't keep going I can't go on like this God, there's financial burdens upon my family that I can't, I can't satisfy anymore. I'm working four jobs in order to make up salary while I'm a full-time student. My wife is working multiple jobs. God, it's difficult. Do you not care? Was the question I kept asking. And I remember God just simply 
gave me a warm embrace in the form of Jessica. I'm asking for God, please just hug me right now. I just need your embrace. And here out of the blue, Jessica just walks in, didn't even know that Jessica was in the house. She comes and just hugs me from behind. And we both weep together on the floor, asking for God to just somehow, somehow fulfill the bankruptcy in our hearts. It wasn't because of sin. We weren't living some sinful life. We weren't doing bad stuff. We were doing what God wanted us to do. But just life was so difficult. And we just needed to learn for the first time that it really doesn't matter about what we're doing. It doesn't matter where we are. What matters is, do I trust God enough to satisfy my heart? Do I have faith enough that God can actually satisfy the thirst in my heart? Luke 15 tells us three parables. The first one is the parable of, anyone know? The lost sheep, the parable of the lost sheep. Here's the shepherd, he has sheep, and one of them runs away and tells us that he leaves the 99 to go and find the one and to bring it back. The second parable is just as important. It's a parable. Which, which parable is it? Who knows that one? The parable of the lost coin. Here's a woman who has this one coin and she loses it within the house in the busyness of life. Anyone ever lost something in your house? Maybe I might be confessing too much right now. Right? You know, having a house with, with two children, oh my goodness, it's chaotic in there. Yes, it's easy to lose something. I, can, I, 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 I actually understand the plight of this woman to lose a coin. Yes, I've lost a coin in my house, and I've been crazy trying to look for it. She's looking for that coin, and she finds it. And, but what does she do and as a response? She goes and says, hey, the whole town, come over. We're having a block party. I'm celebrating because I found one coin. I found what was lost to me. And then the third one is the most important, at least the one for, in this case, the most important one right now, is the story of the father with the two lost sons. Anyone familiar with this one? Sometimes just simply called the story of the prodigal son. But here, the story, this is what Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us, <clears throat> and there was a man who had two sons. Uh, younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that is to coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took the journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Usually when we read this story, we're like, oh, so sad for that father. He just divided everything and just gave it all and the son walks away. But... Sometimes we overlook the reality that uh, when do you receive an inheritance? Do you receive the inheritance when the person is alive or when the person is dead? So this son told him, Father, I can't wait until you die, so give me what belongs to me. I can't even begin to imagine the piercing pain of this father to hear his son say, I can't wait until you die. 20, 15, 10 years, five years from now, it's too long. You don't mean anything to me, Father. Just give me what belongs to me and just call it a wash and see you later. And Scripture tells us that this man loved his son so much that he did that. He divided all that he had. And he gave the one part to the older brother, the other part to the younger brother. Without a word. Without complaining. Without even a question. Why, son? What have I done to you? Nothing. Scripture tells us he just did it. This father loved his son so much that he was okay with the pain. 
says that he took all, all that he had and this young man went into a far country and there he squandered everything he had. Spend it all. And when he had spent it all, scripture tells us that he found himself needing to go and work in this one place because uh, all his uh, supposed friends were taken advantage of him. They squandered all his money. Now they left him. So he's all alone in this foreign country, all by himself, no family, no friends, nothing around. And the worst part of it all, broke. And he found himself in the farm needing to feed pigs. And he was so broke that he didn't even have food enough to feed himself. The pigs ate better than he did. Now, I grew up in, um, in the mountains, and uh, I used to be the one that had to go and feed the pigs. That is no yummy treat. That is very gross food. And to have the thought that someone would be so broken that they would find pig's food appetizing tells me that this person is beyond reach. The scripture tells us that somehow he remembered. The scripture says that he came to his senses. He somehow recognized and realized and remembered the sight of, of his father. Perhaps by his side as he was a little child. Maybe when he was learning how to ride a bicycle and when he fell and his dad was right there to pick him up and brush off the wound and say, it's okay. It's all right. We can do it again. Or perhaps when uh, the summer days, as it's coming around, as you know, we're getting into the pool season, and it's time to learn how to swim, and everyone is playing in the deep end, and here he is as a little kid, probably on the side of the pool, still clinging on, uh, shimming it side to side because he can't really play in the deep, and here comes the father out of nowhere and says, hey, get on my back so you can play with everyone. Or maybe it was at dinner time. Remember the time at a dinner when he was still hungry and the father went over and said, hey, you can have the rest of my food. Or maybe you can have my last cookie. Or maybe you can have the last ice cream. I don't know. But all I know is that this young man remembered his lo the love of his father. And it compelled him to realize, wait a minute, I'm, I'm here worse than the hirings and the servants of my father. They are treated better than what I am. And here I'm just withering away. And in verse 20 of chapter 15, it says, And he arose and came to his father. He decided that he needed to go. He couldn't stand it no more to be away from his father. He got up and he said, I'm going to go to my father. And while he was a far away, he was still in a distance while still rehearsing his apology, perhaps looking at his feet, kicking a stone as he's walking by. Come on, parents, you've seen your child do that, right? I've done that. I caught my mom doing that to me many times where I'm like kicking the rock around and now all of a sudden here comes my mom. Father sees the young man on a great distance away and scripture says not that he turned away and went inside the house, it's not that he went and sent someone to get him. And it's not that he stayed in place waiting to see what the son would do. Scripture says, what did the father do? He ran. He ran, he ran towards the young man. He said, I'm going to go and run and I'm going to have compassion upon my son. Because my son is coming back. I don't care what happened in the past. All I care is that he's here. I'm glad that he's here. I'm content that he's here. And it says that he ran and he fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son began to say to his father, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven and in your sight, right? He begins to actually tell the rehearsed forgiveness, right? The, 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 you know, he had a script. 
And all I'm imagining is the father here hugging his son and the son trying to get through his script of apology to te essentially tell the father, hey, listen, daddy, I don't want to be your son anymore. I know I threw that away. I will be like one of your hired servants. That's exactly what he's about to ask. And the father interrupts him. The father doesn't allow the young son to finish his rehearsed speech. Scripture says, the father said to the servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and put sandals on his feet. Can I have a uh, pianist to come up if it's possible now? The young man was ready to essentially sell himself to his dad because of the debt that he had incurred. And while he's trying to say, I'm sorry to the father, the father interrupts him. He doesn't want to hear the forgiveness. He doesn't want to ask, he doesn't want to hear the sorry. He turns over to his servants and he says, I need a robe, I need a ring, and I need sandals for this young man. Now for us, this may be trivial. But the father is intentional. You see, in the Bible, a robe represents a character. It represents who someone is in the inner core, in the inner being. Someone's character communicates their righteousness, their goodness, their, their ability to do the right thing. We clearly know that the son does not have the ability to do the right thing. He does the wrong thing all the time. You see, the young man is a sinner. The young man is the one who does things that hurt people. The young man needs a different character, clearly. Because inherently, he's not good. But the father doesn't care. The father says, servants, bring me one of my robes. Because this young man needs my character. And this father puts a new robe over this young man, even though this young man has come from the pig pens. He still reeks of pigs. His breath still stinks of pig food. He's still sweaty, perhaps bruised and injured. And yet the father says, this man, this young boy of mine, deserves my robe deserves to be clothed like me. Growing up, I grew up in a house with just a single mom, but I had my grandfather around. And my greatest joy was, to, was when I was able to put on his clothes. I remember when we went out on different outings, I would put on his dress shirts and his dress pants and his shoes, and I would be so proud. My goodness, I've seen pictures, and they were just baggy clothes. That didn't matter. I was happy because I was wearing my grandfather's clothes. I looked like my grandfather. I smelled like my grandfather. Yes, inside I was, I was Joe. Yes, inside I was just a little kid. But my goodness, I remember those pictures you would see. The, the clothes is all baggy, but my smile is big because I'm wearing my grandfather's clothes. And this father did the same thing for his son. He said, I don't care how much you stink. I want you looking like me. Now, that's what the robe means. The, the ring is even more important because the ring in that time me meant that you had authority over the household. 
You see, the ring was important because through the ring, you had the authority to open letters and correspondence, and you were able to speak on behalf of other people. A ring was everything. And the fact that now the father gave this son a ring said, not only do you look like me, but you have the same voice and authority like me. Then a scripture also says that he got sandals. God wanted him to know that no longer do you walk upon your own works. You're not just doing it on your own. It's my feet. You were in my shoes. And they're not too big for you to fill. They're just perfect for you, son. This father loved his son so much that he said, look, you're going to look like me, you're going to speak like me, and you're going to walk like me. And it's not going to be impossible. And that's the promise that God has for you today. God is promising you today, if you believe in him, that you can look like him, you can talk like him, and you can walk like him. It is not too far off. It is not in the distance. It's not up in the skies in heaven or in the depths of the sea. Scripture says that God's word and his will is right near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. All you need to do is confess, Jesus Christ, you're my Lord and Savior, and to believe that he is your king. And once you do that, instantly, Scripture tells us you're clothed like God is, you're speaking like he does, and you're walking like he does. You see, the story has always been called the story of the prodigal son, but today I want to challenge you that it's actually not the prodigal son, but in reality, it's actually the story of the prodigal father. The father who extravagantly and lavishly gifted us all of heaven so that you may look, talk, and walk just like him. Scripture tells us that God gave us the darling of heaven, the pearl of great price, so that you may be saved. God was reckless with what he had so that you can make it to heaven. So that you can be his and you can be, and he can be yours. Do you believe in God's promise? Do you believe that God is going to save you? If that is so, please stand up with me. And I'm going to invite our worship team to join me up front. If that is you, you're saying, look, yes, I want salvation. If that's you, please stand up. And as the worship team is uh, starting to play and, 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 and plays our song, I want to invite anyone that wants to have a word of prayer, a specific word of prayer with me. Perhaps you want to recomm recommit your life, or maybe you want to say, Pastor, I need to make that step, and I don't know how to. I want to invite you to join us up front. If there's someone here that says, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I want to make that commitment right now, please join me up front. Please come forward so I can pray for you.